So, first of all, congratulations on, on At My Table. Thank it's, you. A, it's such a good book. I really enjoyed yes, reading I it. So. And it marks almost 20 years of cookbook writing for you. I know. How to Eat was published in, in 1998. Did, did you, at that point, did you ever imagine that you would have stayed with it for this long? Or? No, I, I didn't. I mean, it's, it, it, I was already surprised that I'd written a uh, cookbook, although it was a mix, it was sort mm -hmm. of a food book rather than a cookbook, it was both. Um, but then I got an idea for a second book uh, while I was writing that, and then I thought that was those two and that was that, and it, it transpires that's not been the case. Why? Because I enjoy it, and I believe in doing things that give me pleasure. Uh, so, so every now and then I think, well, you know, should I do other things? Maybe, and but I, but I enjoy it, and I enjoy reflecting on food. I like, I like the cooking part, and I like the writing part. When well, I, mean, I say I like the writing part, um, all, all those of us who write, both, I enjoy the writing part, but it's also I do an awful lot to postpone the writing part. <laughs> um, That's because you're a writer. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I enjoy it, and I and I and I feel there's an awful lot to be said about life through food. Right, right. What are the, as with all the, your books, um, you have a very specific point of view about food. And uh, in the introduction to At My Table, I'm gonna, next couple questions I'm gonna preface with quotes, so bear with me. Um, you wrote, our, our gastronomic awakening has been to a huge extent restaurant-led. It is, you might argue, by tasting food that we have become interested in cooking it. But restaurant food and home food are not the same thing, or more accurately, eating in restaurants is not the same thing as eating at home. Well, I went back and looked at the direction for the first book. Yeah. It, it, the message was pretty much the same. Yes. When did you start learning about food? Well, I learned about food from a very young age. I came from a food-obsessed family. Mm -hmm. And when I was young, it was considered really uh, vulgar uh, in England to talk about food. You know, not not vulgar is the wrong word, but you didn't do it in polite society. You didn't, you didn't say that was wonderful or like that. But, and I think, it, but nevertheless, in my family, everyone always, we, we, we spoke not just about what we were eating, but what we'd eaten before and then what we were going to eat. <laughs> and uh, that was always a big subject. Now, funnily enough, I was actually a very, um, I wasn't much of an eater as a child, you know, I didn't start eating properly until I was about 15. But nevertheless, you know, I was, I, I was brought up in that culture. It was a language we spoke. When you say that you weren't very, that you weren't much of an eater when you were young, was it because you were picky, which would indicate possibly a, a certain discernment, or was it just that you weren't interested? Um, I think, I think about this, I can't remember enough except that I was brought up in an incredibly old-fashioned way. I mean, there was, I mean, my childhood was, you know, a very long time ago, but this was old-fashioned <laughs> even then, um, which was that if you didn't uh, eat everything in front of you, well, you had to eat everything in front of you, and if you didn't, it would be brought back cold at the next meal. And this is not <laughs> a way to make anyone interested in eating, and it, I also think it makes everything into a battle. Right. And that's not good. I got, I, I got more interested in eating the more uh, sort of input I had over what I was eating. I was interested in food, and I did eat something. You know, I, I mean, for example, I did, you know, I used to spend Fridays with my maternal grandmother, and we'd go to the butcher together and get something. And I remember, you know, we used to, um, we used to have um, brains with brown butter and capers, delicious. And um, she always used to tease me. I mean, I ate more with my grandmother than I did at home. <laughs> but she always used to tease me once that it was, a, it was strangely for Britain, but it was very, very hot. We were in Brighton by the sea, and it was an incredibly hot day, and she thought, we have to go into a cafe and get some water and something, get cool. And as I went in, I'm, they said, what would you like? And I said, could I have some hot chocolate and buttered spinach? <laughs> and um, so I obviously had my own notions of what I wanted to eat when. I wasn't, so I wasn't picky in the sense that I only wanted to eat um, sort of children's food, right. but it was difficult, and I think, I, I think I didn't like the culture of eating, and it's, you know, like school food was pretty bad. But then, funnily enough, I was sent to boarding school, and that, um, that made me really get interested in food, because 
the food was so bad there. I spent all my time, you know, I'd be reading food books or I'd be thinking about what I wanted to eat. So in many ways, that, that's when my food obsession started. And part of that is that, 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 that you know, uh, following through with cooking, um, you have control over that now. Yes. Uh, and also, I think, um, that, it, that for me, the food became associated with home. Because, um, you know, when you're at boarding school, it's, it, you're not at home. And you're, you're eating in an in sort of institutionalized way. So the, so the sort of, it's often about simple things, like, uh, you know, a soft boiled egg that's going to be just as you want it. Or, and, and, and uh, you know, a bowl of soup that, that reminds you of home. So all those things have, uh, I suppose, have much more currency. Was there a time when you didn't want to cook, and what changed that? No, do you know, there wasn't, but I do understand it. And for many women of my generation, their mothers were insistent their daughters didn't get chained, you know, to the stove. Right. And I understood that, but then you couldn't... You, anything that you, any particular mold you force yourself into becomes a prison. So, but you know, in, in a way, just if, if you want to define yourself by cooking, that can be as difficult as defining yourself by not cooking. And I think that it's difficult because I enjoy cooking and mm -hmm. I cook a lot. And maybe it is partly a control issue. And, uh, but nevertheless, I think that you know, you, one has the freedom to change or to learn to do different things. And one of the things that made a big difference for me was learning how, how to bake, because I'd been brought up thinking there were cooks and there were bakers, and I was a cook. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't bake, and I didn't, wasn't gonna, couldn't make pastry and all that. So wh when I became someone who could, it was so liberating, because we, we, I do think we tend to decide in advance or decide to... Um, exaggeratedly, what kind of a person we are, that I'm not that kind of a person, and I am that kind of a person. And in some ways, it, you know, it's, it's, it's helpful, but I think may maybe, maybe it does make us too fixed in our identities. And the stakes are higher, I think, for women than for men. I mean, as a, as a, as a guy who learned how to cook, it was mm. like anything that I did was praiseworthy because mm. my wife didn't have to cook. Um, yeah. But I think for a woman, uh, it, there's yeah. always um, uh, there's a stigma attached to being a to not being a good cook. Like, for example, for me, I was everybody, all the men in my family worked on cars, and I, you know, I could turn them, I could turn a, you know, changing the spark plugs into a $500 engine rebuild with just like, it was it was completely simple. Yeah. But it was different for cooking, and I think yes. That, I think that's true. I think it's changing. I don't know. I, you know, all the young people I know, um, I feel that there isn't a huge difference between the young men and the young women in cooking, mm -hmm. if anything. Because when, you know, in a way, what you're talking about, when I was younger, when men cooked, it was with uh, a bit of a fanfare. And it would be quite elaborate. It wouldn't be everyday food, and it would be right. quite elaborate, and it wouldn't be just the sort of food that is, you know, put on the table. And I think that may be changing. I also think, you know, what I would say is, is that I think you need to create a sense of home and a sense of safety at home for men or women. I think we all need that. And there are many ways of doing that, and some, but for me and for a lot of people, that it's through cooking. Right, right. In the same essay, you write about the current culture's uh, promiscuous use of the word chef, uh, which now seems to apply to almost anyone who can stand facing a stove. Um, you write, and I think this is, this is important following on what you had said, we are not chefs. We can't do things that chefs can do. We don't have the time, energy, or training. But to deduce that we are uh, inadequate at the task of create, creatively feeding ourselves and others is madness. So to you, what, what are the most important differences between restaurant cooking and home cooking? Well, I think that res I think restaurant Cooking um, relies on uniformity, conformity. I think it, to a certain extent, it uh, relies on novelty. Um, and I, you know, I think it's showmanship to some extent. Mm -hmm. And I love the theater of a restaurant. And I also am, am very inspired by chefs. But th the thing is, is that a chef has to cook under different conditions that 
you you people come into a restaurant you have to get their food pretty quickly and you don't know what they're going to order and i think maybe crucially is that when you see it say a table of four people in a restaurant, the chances are they're going to feel it's only worth it if they all order something different. Right. Whereas at home, what makes eating around a table so important at home is that you're sharing the same food. And that's symbolic as well. Right. I love serving on platters because then it forces people to, yes. it really cements that connection that we're all eating the same yes, thing. Yes, I think that's important. And I do think that... Um, the, 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 there's something, you know, there's, there's something about being given a, a plate in the restaurant. That's fine, and you expect it like that. But it is odd if people do that at home. It's transactional. Yes, I suppose so. And I think that that, it, that, that is the difference. I mean, uh, you know, as yet, you know, people. Well, I suppose there are there are the sort of food, the, ha the <laughs> restaurant versions of Airbnb. But generally, you don't charge people in your home, and uh, <laughs> it's it and it's much. I think that, and this is hard as well, because I think when people, if you're spending money and you go to a restaurant, you, you sort of feel like you don't want to spend that money for something you can do at home. Right. And so you want something. So in a way, it, it's, it's unfair to criticize chefs for doing showy offy food, because that's what people want. Right. To a certain extent. Um, but, but I think at home, Really, I mean, I went out, you know, I'm on the road now, and I went out last Friday night to some friend's house, and it was just for me, just so wonderful. So I got there, traffic was bad, and I'd been working, and I got there, and there was just some pistachio nuts and olives first, just sitting around, and then wonderful uh, tarragon chicken, roast chicken with tarragon, it was beautiful, some broccoli rub and a salad, and then some cheese afterwards. Now. Most people, I mean, it, that to me is like, that's a, you know, Friday night dinner, how lovely. What, what, what's better? Right. And I think that the idea that people have, which is it's meant to be more like a restaurant, that I've got to think of all these different courses and um, I want to impress, but that's not what you want. I mean, that's not what you want from someone's house and you want to be welcomed and feel relaxed and share something. And it's, it's I think that's so important. I think essentially home cooking is about the is about the guest and, and rather than about the cook. Yes, I think that's true, and I think good restaurants understand that too. That it's right. it's a bit about both because in a way the rest we were talking a bit earlier about you know how we don't go out very much to restaurants, but um, you t you return to the restaurants where you're comfortable in the room, and the same at people's houses. You know you have to feel comfortable. And it's so much more important to make someone feel comfortable than for, th for them to think, this is the most wonderful culinary exp gastronomic experience of my life. Right. And I think the same is true in a restaurant. I think that I, I find it kind of unrelaxing if um, you know, there's that big fanfare as they bring the food or that um, you're expected to respond all the time. You know, I, 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 know, I don't know how they make things different, but it's also that thing when you're talking to the person at dinner in the restaurant and they just say, they just interrupt <laughs> to say, to ask you something about the food. And you think, actually, food is about conversation as well. And um, when you've had a good night with friends and you've had a great evening, the food is an important part, but it, it isn't actually the most important part. And I say that as a greedy person. <laughs> Uh, again with the quotes, and I uh, promise you, this is, this is the last one. In the, in the introduction to At My Table, you write, and I'm going to paraphrase just a little bit, a recipe is a way of finding order in the mess of life. And because of this, it must always be reliable and as exact as possible, even if cooking itself can never be a precise art. So as a recipe writer, how do you balance the need to be reliable and exact uh, with the desire, which is evident in your recipes, to allow the cook or to allow the reader some leeway for mm. creativity. It's a constant struggle because um, I have to, you know, I write at such length, as you can imagine, that I, in the end things have to be cut, otherwise the recipe goes on for five pages because I'm saying, well, it really depends, you know, it depends on what pan you're using and I find this. And uh, so what I try and do, I think about this an awful lot, 
Um, and I, I try and give a range of measurement when, I, when it's not crucial. So you can tell if there's quite a lot of difference. If it's, you know, one to two cups of, of something, you know, that it doesn't really matter. So you, know, you can sort of do what you think. I try and explain in the recipe what I'm looking for and why I'm using a particular ingredient. So perhaps you can work out perhaps what you could substitute, because you can't actually write every possible substitution in and when it matters and when it doesn't matter. Um, in baking, I am very precise. Mm -hmm. But even so, you can't just say, put bake in the oven for 30 minutes, because ovens do vary. And you need, so I, I think I will g give a range of time, and I will always say, um, again, what to look for, how you can tell this particular cake is ready. One of the things that really impressed me, or one of the things that has really impressed me about your recipes is, is how you balance. Um, as a recipe writer, you know, you always want to try and cover every possibility. You know, it's like, what's it going to look like? How is it going to be? What should it smell like at this point? What, uh, and, you know, you end up with like a Judy Rogers cookbook where it takes eight pages to, mm. to roast a chicken. Um, with your recipes, the technique part is very, uh, the, the writing is deceptively casual, but you always seem to get, you seem to hit those, those key points in the technique, but still keep it to like a page or two. Well, sometimes I do, and sometimes is that, is I do. Is that a good editor? Or? Or? <laughs> no, I, sometimes I do, um, and it really depends. So when I really feel it needs more space, then I will give that, and I often do that in the introduction. You know, my introductions are not just, mm -hmm. um, you know, clearing my throat. There's an element in yeah. that. But um, I, you know, it's, 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 it's easier to explain something like that in an introduction. I think, in a way, I, I feel I carry my readers with me a bit, and they know what, how I cook, and you know, what I think is important. And I, and I feel that I have to bring people into the kitchen. So I don't want to, I'm not interested in barking orders at people. Mm -hmm. So I do want to be quite conversational and to, to, to say about, you know, don't worry about it here or look for that. And I think it's, I think it's important. And it's, it, there are, you know, there are times when I need more space and at other times I think if I write too much, by it actually makes things more complicated. It makes it seem more complicated. But it, it, but it, no, but it depends because you see the thing is is that you can't you can't cover every eventuality. I mean, really, sometimes I think I, you could make one recipe be the entire length of a book. Um, so you've got to know when to let go. And I'm 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 quite a ruthless editor, um, and I suppose I'm used to editing myself, and, I, I, and I'm ruthless about what recipes stay in a book and which recipes don't, and I go over and over again, and, I, and there's one thing I do which I think is helpful when you write recipes, but I don't think it's particularly helpful, um, you know, I as a way of training one's personality, which <laughs> is that I'm always trying to uh, work out what could go wrong and what... Um, and how to stop it, and how to preempt something that's difficult, and um, how I can make things simpler ahead of the time. So I think it's not a good thing to be <coughs> like, but it's very necessary. I mean, I am very, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned with those elements and those details. But your conversa your style is is very conversational. It is and it but isn't. But it's not chatty. Yes. You know, chatty, yes. chatty kind of natters off and yeah. does. You know. Yes, it's conversational to an extent, but it's really more... Um, it sounds like a human wrote it. Yes. Oh, I, yes, a human did write it. It is in my voice. And I have a very... And I have my voice. But it's... You know, the rhythm of the sentence is very important to me. Even in, even in recipe technique? Yes, although I struggle because I sometimes have to... Sometimes I have to allow the words to clunk up against one another, but, and I, it, it makes me unhappy, <laughs> but um, you have to say, you know, repeat the words add or stir right. a lot, and it, I, I have to let go of my vanity because it makes it clearer 
for the reader. But uh, and that's that you know that that it can't always it can't always be elegant. <laughs> <laughs> um, like most good home cooks, I think um, it you don't really invent recipes out of mm -hmm. it kind of out of whole cloth. It doesn't just kind of land. But you kind of take things that you love and then make them so that you love them even more. Yeah. So they, they start from a certain place and then you And I always like to them. talk about what place they start. If I've had an idea, I mean there are some recipes I get an idea from another recipe. I change absolutely everything in the recipe more or less, but I still want to say where I got the right. idea. I think that's very important. Well that's a perfect lead in because we've got half a dozen slides or so of dishes and I I hope that you would be willing to kind of yes. walk us through where this dish started from. Uh, the first one is the um, Indian spiced chicken and potato. There you right. go. Right. Yes, I can exactly say where that started many, many years ago, probably 20 years ago, maybe more. Um, I didn't write about it. This is, I ate some potatoes by Samin Rushdie. Uh, Salman Rushdie's sister, who's a very good cook, and I got into the habit of cooking, and I credited her Indian potatoes before then, I mean, obviously they're not really called that, but, and I loved the potatoes with lots of spice, but they were quite, her potatoes were roast, really, rather than, um, you know, they were fried in a pan, and I liked that a lot, and I often did cook chicken to go alongside, and then one day, I didn't actually write about this when I was doing this, because I've done it for so many years, um, I thought well, I would like the idea of having the chicken actually cooked in, a, I call it a tray bake, but it's like a you know, sheet pan chicken. So I did the potatoes and I, and I tried them, just roast like that, and I didn't feel, uh, I, I felt that I lost the intensity in the potatoes and I wanted it more to have a more of an Indian feel which meant not roasting them. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, added, I went on different permutations. So they've got many spices, cumin, fennel, uh, mustard seed, some turmeric, uh, nigella seed, a um, bit of an egomania there, but I have to put it in. And, you get a royalty, uh, and right? I did, <laughs> and, I, and I added some lime. I needed the sourness you get sometimes in Indian uh, cooking. So I added lime zest and lime juice and tried again, and then I needed more water because I didn't want them to dry out as they cooked. Mm -hmm. And actually, I was very pleased when I was on tour in Britain with this, and I was in the north of England, and uh, where there was a big Indian community, and they said, oh, we love this, because it tastes so Indian, but it's not Indian. <laughs> um, and so the chicken juices go into the potatoes, too. So I, in a way, and uh, so that's where that recipe comes from. It started from the from. potatoes. It started from the potatoes. What about the pear pistachio and rose cake? That's a beautiful dish. Oh, yeah, the pear pistachio and rose cake, I did well in, I have forever done uh, a sort of flourless uh, cake that I mixed with fruit, and I started off with a clementine cake. And then uh, in one book, I thought, well, why can't I do another fruit? And I did a cake with um, apples. I made an apple puree, and well, apple sauce you could, and then I made it th and, and tried that. And then in my last book, I, I mean, especially in these days, people love gluten-free cakes, but I've always cooked this, because I like the, I like the, 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 the heft, in a way, of a cake. Mm -hmm that was made like this, and so I did a cake with um, my last book with dried apricots. And then I was come, wanted to do a birthday cake for a friend of mine who doesn't eat flour. And I thought I would try making this cake with pear, but I thought, well, you really don't need to cook it in a week, because if you cook pear, I don't think it's, I didn't need to in the way I do with an apple. So I just tried it, and because I'm quite lazy, I thought, oh, I'm not gonna peel them either. I mean, I took the core out, mm -hmm. and made that great thing. And um, I wanted some pistachios and a bit of rose water. 
and it worked wonderfully, and I got those edible rose petals, which are sort of edible. I mean, you wouldn't choose to eat more than one of them. <laughs> uh, but they do look rather beautiful. And what's quite funny is that Yotel Montalengi and I have got an identical cake. I mean, I mean, in our books came out at the same time, so it wasn't as if one of you know, obviously that's and then obviously that's slightly you know under the influence of Yotam's particular school of cooking. But I cook, I make that an awful lot because it's so easy. You just put everything in the processor all at once, oh. and um, so it's just that thing of, as you say, I I know vaguely what weights and measures work in terms of the proportion the or the ratios, and I. And then I, I work from that, and I had to play a bit with the pairs. Mm -hmm. And I dare say, you know, and, and it, what's quite good with this one is that, you know, it's quite good if they're not, if they're not too ripe. And since it seems to me with pears that they nearly always get them when they're not very ripe. Right. And then they go from, so that's quite useful. <laughs> <laughs> what about the queen of puddings? <gasps> queen of puddings. Well, that's a very uh, old-fashioned, traditional uh, British, well, we call it a pudding and dessert. Um, and it's like many very, very traditional uh, desserts. Uh, puddings, you have pudding, that. if you think of bread pudding, it's one that uses up leftover bread. So in the olden days, if you had leftover bread and you had eggs, you would separate the eggs, you'd make a custard with the yolks and put the breadcrumbs in, and then you'd make a meringue with the whites and you put a jam in between the two. It's, it's, it was, it's one of those like nursery puddings right. or old gentleman's club uh, puddings. Now I use a brioche or challah and then that for this, I mean you can use ones, but um, it's rather wonderful sometimes going into the past and, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and revisiting recipes like that. And it's such a, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it looks beautiful and it's, it's, it looks I think, delicious. It is really delicious. <laughs> it's very old fashioned tasting, as you can imagine. You know, it's, it's, um, it hasn't got a huge interplay of textures. It really is something you just spoon in pudding. very happily. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about the radicchio chestnut and blue cheese salad? Well, do you know what? That, I, I adore um, radicchio. I like all those bitter leaves. Now, I. That is slightly based on a recipe I did for the New York Times a long time ago, when I there's a dressing I did for a there's a dressing I did for a salad when I was writing a restaurant column for the New York Times, and it's um, it's really bitter it's for bitter orange which for us is like marmalade season mm -hmm. we have to spill oranges but you actually otherwise just approximate it with using ordinary eating orange and lime juice. Mm -hmm. And it's got some whole grain mustard and a teeny bit of honey and um, just a teeny bit of uh, toasted sesame oil. And I sort of carried on using that because, you know, when you find that, normally I don't make a dressing. I just squeeze a bit of lemon, right. put a bit of salt, a bit of olive oil and just toss the salad. But I like that dressing and because I use, you know, we get uh, bitter oranges in, mm -hmm. in around January. It's when the, in winter, it's when the uh, bitter leaves are at their best. I mean, radicchio mm -hmm. is so good then, fennel is good. And so I was really playing with uh, those winter flavors and sort of making it. And so I had some vacuum packed chestnuts at home. And so I used that with it. And I just feel there is just something about you know, the, 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 um, yeah, the, the mixture of the sharpness the and the oranges and the texture and the different flavor and blue cheese. I mean, any excuse, I'll put it, blue cheese. <laughs> and actually, I do sometimes, and it, I do sometimes make this with uh, walnuts, not chestnuts. Mm -hmm. It depends on the time of year. And of course, this is a very traditional, you know, the blue cheese, mm -hmm. uh, walnuts and radicchio is a very classic Italian uh, mm -hmm. combination. What do we got? Uh, the spicy mint lamb. I like this story. Oh, uh, yeah, this is well. The, I'm going to talk to you Plus about. I like lamb chops. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about a sauce that will appall a lot of people. So, in England, we have a very uh, traditional mint sauce that we have with lamb. And I remember my mother would always make it, and she'd have a little hand mincer for the mint, and she'd add a teeny bit of sugar to help the flavor come out. I mean, really, like a pinch of sugar, not nothing more, and it would be boiling water and vinegar. 
and it sounds disgusting, but it actually is rather nice, and we like it. And, and you eat it, and the, you know, the, the French look down on us, but we eat it with lamb. And I had some lamb cutlets, which I thought, and I had some preserved lemons in my fridge, because I, I love using pre preserved lemons when I cook, and then I always want to use recipes that we use them up. I don't like, I don't, what is the point of, you know, just leaving ingredients not there's always you half know, a jar in always, every refrigerator. There's always, you know, there's always, always something, and I just thought, right, I'm going to use these. And I did a, I suppose you could say, com using the flavors, the sharpness, because a preserved lemon is really mm -hmm. quite intensely sour. So instead of vinegar, I used the preserved lemons, and I added garlic as well. But basically, it's like a new take on a mint sauce. And since, and, and then I echo the fresh mint, um, of in the uh, thank you um, the I uh, echo the fresh mint that's in the salsa which it really is with um, dried mint when I marinate the um, when I marinate the lambs and the lamb I, and I normally do thyme so I'm really I, I without thinking I will do you know thyme and lemon and this bit of uh, red pepper mm -hmm. flakes but the I do it with the dried mint and I make this a lot and of course as you know recipes don't stop when they are put in a book. And since then, I find I just use such a different mixture of herbs because those preserved lemons make it, I mean, they're so great. And I use this with the meat, but it's equally good. I often have it in the weekday supper on a roast sweet potato or, you know, you oh. can dip chips in it and it's just great. That sounds wonderful. Mm. I'm making myself hungry now. <laughs> Now, this is one I don't think you'll find a traditional route for anywhere, the, the tomato and horseradish salad. No, I, well, that, I'm that afraid, is just, that is, and it works so well. You're getting kind of so chef well. there. No, it wasn't, <laughs> it, it was really just, you know, having, you know, leftovers and having the, you know, horseradish in the fridge and sort of feeling, well, Fresh I, horseradish. Fresh horseradish in the fridge because I think of my memory, and I don't know, is that I'd, I'd had roast beef and I'd made some fresh horseradish sauce to have with it. And then I thought when I was making, you know, wanting to have the cold beef and having some tomatoes, using the rest of some of the horseradish in the dressing. And it's, it's extraordinary how well it works. Um, I, I, you know, I, did, I wasn't actually planning to write a recipe with it, but then it worked. So then I had to work out how much I'd put in, you know, and go backwards, <laughs> you have to go back and do and it again and again. <laughs> and yes, that's, well, that is the story of writing uh, uh, cookbooks, isn't right. it? The endless reverse engineering from, from the food one eats at home. And, that, and, it, and it's so great. And I've since had it with mackerel, and uh, like all oh. oily fish. It's so well, wonderful with a horseradish. Yes. And uh, Turkish eggs? Well, Turkish eggs, um, I should say, I, got, I had from Turkey, but it wasn't. There's a restaurant in London uh, that a friend of mine who is a Kiwi uh, has, and I, uh, and I was there for brunch, and I thought, and I, and I had, this is something called chilbur, I think, as far as I can work out. So you, you're nodding if anyone's Turkish. If I've done too many, I can't help myself. <laughs> and um, I'd read about this, and I'd always thought, I, I really poached eggs on yogurt. It doesn't sound very good, but anyway, let me try it. And I really loved his, I really loved it, actually. And I, then when I wanted to do it myself at home, first I had to teach myself how to poach eggs. It's been one of the things I've always been <laughs> frightened of. Uh, well, there are many other things, but that's one thing. But also, I... I suppose, you know, you try, you change things as you like them. So what I did then is I made it smaller amounts because it, uh, it is really terribly rich. So it looks like it's quite a mean, uh, you know, uh, amount of quantities in the book. But, uh, you know, everyone who reads my recipes knows that my portions are not mean. So, um, <laughs> but I, well, I felt that I wanted the uh, yogurt. It's, you do a sort of yogurt with um, garlic, it's salty and salt and garlic in it, quite strong. It's not like an everyday breakfast. Um, and so I did it in a bain-marie, you know, in a bowl over water, because I found that when I did, when I put the Greek yogurt like that, that it whipped up a little. You do that a couple, in a couple yeah, of the I know, recipes. It's I a know. really great tip. And I did that, and I... I found it just whipped up, yeah, yeah. and I also felt that the it 
it sort of married with the poached egg better mm -hmm. because the temperatures were the same. It, mm -hmm. it, and I did that as well in the, in the fatty when I, when I um, made it. And I think I'm not terribly good about having ingredients too cold. Mm -hmm. I think that it stops you tasting them. Right, right. Uh, and last, I get uh, the rose and pepper pavlova, which oh, is res. just well. beautiful. <laughs> well, I, I'm a complete, as I've said before, I'm a pavaholic. And <laughs> um, I'm always interested in, in coming up with new uh, variations. But this is the, this, the, the rose and uh, pepper, well, the, really the, the key factors here is that it's pepper and strawberries. My maternal grandfather always had pepper on his strawberries. And in fact, it was an Edwardian practice. Obviously, he wasn't that old, but um, it's and he and I was thinking about that. And he always used to say it made the berries sing. And I played with various different ways of doing this. And I actually felt, for me, what worked is putting the pepper inside the meringue part. Mm -hmm. And I balanced that with uh, some rose water, and it gives it a sort of almost Turkish delight. Uh, feel, but not as not as um, strong as that sounds. And I also feel that there's something about me that I quite like the <coughs> fact that I'm using what I used to refer to as school pepper, the sort of pepper that all chefs would look down on, because it's you buy it in a tub ready ground, <laughs> and that's what you need to make this recipe, which I like. And then with the strawberries, I actually macerate them in some passion fruit juice, <coughs> and it's just a it's a it's a wonderful combination. It sounds like it. But in a way, that's what it's so. It's a, I get interested in the in the play of flavors. Mm -hmm. um, someone once wrote, "To know a man's library is, in some measure, to know his mind." I think that's true of cooks in their kitchens as mm -hmm. well. Uh, can you describe your home kitchen for us, and what are what are some of the things that are in it that might surprise us? My home kitchen. It's so incredible. It's got it's so got, got so much clutter, and it's very hard to. I said, I'm. It's more. It's how I construct my kitchen. So I, d I don't like things um, in drawers too much or behind shell, behind cupboards. They're so I won't have any. I don't have any doors on a on cupboards which are above sort of waist height, because I find it makes me feel claustrophobic. They're all coming in at me, and I like <laughs> to see everything. I like to see every plate I've got and the bowls. I mean, there are some ugly things I do keep um, <laughs> underneath, and if I don't use them a lot, but most of that, I have all my saucepans and everything hanging up around over the, over the stove, over what we call a hob. Um, but the difficulty about that, obviously, is you have to wash them an awful lot because you're getting grease. <laughs> you get on good morning. Yeah. I... Or I Yes, I like everything. I I feel the the thing with um, you know cupboards uh, that or drawers is that it you always find the wrong things in it. So I find <laughs> you know I keep as much cutlery in out in in little not quite vases but that sort of thing. So I think otherwise. Um, I keep too much, you know, I once read an article saying that no serious cook keeps any, you know, bottle of anything out by the stove. Well, I just keep oh. I've, <laughs> so much out by the stove. Um, so I feel that sometimes I feel I have to have a big clearing up session every now and then. And if something starts living by the stove, it ends up there. <laughs> I have many different forms of chili and, well, you know, pepper by the stove too. But I don't know if I have things that would surprise. Um, but I, and I have many, yes, I, and I liked, and I've got more oven gloves and tea towels than you can believe possible everywhere. What Even though gadgets? I sometimes forget. Gadgets. I mean, some people, some cooks like sneer at them, some cooks collect them, and are there, are there handy tools that? I, there are, but also I am, the, I am, I, I, I will buy, I mean, I have to stop myself buying things. And I did once, one of my books had a whole chapter called My Kitchen Gadget Hall of Shame. <laughs> and, um, well, I, and I think it's interesting because I can be very emphatic that something's not worth having in one book and then 10 years later I've completely changed my mind. <laughs> um, but I'm very, very fond of, an, you call it an immersion blender. Oh, uh -huh. you, Yes? Not you personally, yeah. but generally. I think that is 
I feel now. Oh, I you do that. the aioli with it in this book too. Yeah, I, I do stick blender. I call it. I make curry paste. I use it all the time. I think it's worth getting the one that has the strongest motor you can. But I find I don't really use a processor that so much now. I mean, I've got one, but I I find probably a stick the same blender. one that you started with. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think that. I am sure over the years I've gone through rather too many of them. But um, I certainly, I certainly, I mean, like, I don't have a blender at the moment. I, that's also true because I have a Nutribullet, which I stare at. And, um, uh, but, I, but, but I certainly think an immersion blender is wonderful and it's much easier on the washing up. Yeah. And I like it. And I realize as well that I like it because I'm sort of part of the cooking. I'm not, it's not taken away from me. When it's in the processor, you have to put a lid on and then I feel left out. Right. <laughs> and there's always a chance that the lid's going to... Yeah, that's <laughs> maybe. But I don't know, so I like that. And I'm very keen on the microplane graters. Oh. You know, the fine, I really love those. And silicone those. spatulas. Um, I do like silicone spatulas. They are great. Um, they don't make my heart sing, <laughs> um, but they are, you know. But Not they like are olive good. wood wood or something no, like but that. I, but I mean, it, but they are very useful, I admit. Um, I just wish they weren't such ugly colors yes. often. <laughs> uh, but so, and otherwise, um, well, my Metzaluna, you know, the oh. double <laughs> the handled knife, that I couldn't really live without. Um, the good, I mean, I get pleasure from good pots and pans. Right. And, yeah, good knives and good pots and pans. And it's, yeah. Uh, you've always been really frank about how you kind of develop these mad passions for ingredients that kind of ebb and flow with, yes. uh, with the years. Um, you, 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 I think you, you wrote once about an editor who described your first book as a pea marsala and rhubarb cookbook. Yes. Um, I seem to notice like a lot of coconut products in, in at my table. Are there other well, there's coconut actually oil there was more. Like there was more in my last book, oh. I suppose. But I I'm very yes I'm very fond of coconut milk yogurt, um, and I find it great in cooking. So I suppose I go in for that, and I must still have some I some coconut oil. I use it a bit. I think it's also because I've got and I have got my you know I've got a couple of coconut things in the book. You know, my <laughs> My, you know, I got that coconut snowball cake. So what is it that you're, what, what is it that you're passionate about now? Is there an ingredient that, yes, there you, that was wasn't preserved, in the last one? Yes, there's, but there are very few ingredients that I haven't used before. Right. But you know, but I'm certainly there are a lot more preserved lemons in this book, although they did feature earlier. I still like miso. I had white miso in my very first book 20 years ago. I, had, but now I'm using it. Then I felt I should use it. It, it was more in a in that was authentic to, um, you know, its culture, whereas now I, like that, I don't <laughs> mind. I've always been a bit like, you know, so I've got a white, I've got a hummus with white miso in, um, which obviously is complete culture clash. I was at a restaurant a, 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 a month ago up in Napa, and they, they did a, like a crudite platter with just a, well, of course it was Napa, so they did their house fermented white miso, but, but that was the dipping sauce, and it was, it was brilliant. Oh, it's so wonderful. And it's, I've got, a, I do a chicken where I, um, you know, just mix white miso and ginger and garlic and some soy and a bit of uh, sesame oil. Uh, mostly that comes a bit later. And it's, I love it. But I've always um, been keen on ginger. And I've recently just, uh, you know, with turmeric, I've been just started using fresh turmeric, which I like. I mean, it is, you know, it does make you touch it and you look like you've been, you smoke <laughs> 60 a day, but still. So that was, uh, let's talk about some of the questions from the audience. Okay. Are you ready? To, uh, Always. Uh, Barbara Bush enjoyed a glass of bourbon on her last night on Earth. If you had a choice, what would be your last drink or meal on Earth? Well, the, t my last drink would be... Uh, a cup of tea, a <laughs> mug of tea. Um, well, last meal on earth, I always find it's difficult because I feel like I could go on and on and on and on and on. Um, you don't but, want it to end too soon, like one course and it's like... No, I would like to carry on. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'll never really, I think. You know, so I think I, you know, I would always, I always feel, um, I go slightly basic, you know, old-fashioned things, the very traditional Italian, 
um, you know, pasta with clams, but the white, you know, white mm -hmm. sauce, no tomatoes for me. I'm northern Italian, not southern Italian. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, 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 you know, roast chicken, mm. for sure, roast chicken. I wonder how many cooks would answer that. Yeah. I think that, I think that there yes. would be a significant All number. Cooks. The a perfect cooks. roast chicken is just... Yes, the perfect roast chicken. Although I quite, I might have to have that pea, my pea and chicken tray bake simply because <laughs> I do love. You know, I find there's something about peas which is so comforting. I'd have to have a very sharp fennel and lemon salad, but then I might also have to have a you know a really good um, grass-fed steak and you know really good fat chips. Yeah, um, so I mean, we're getting up to six or seven courses. You yeah, may never well, have to leave. Always, <laughs> you'd have to. Fat fries. Fat fries in this country. Fat fries. And dessert. And um, oh. I'd have to have a really beautiful uh, blue cheese, mm -hmm. some fresh blackberries and cream, and, you know, I think maybe a pavlova. <laughs> and then I'd have to end on a savoury note, so I go back into the cheese then. <laughs> Or a really fantastic well, salad, a breakfast. very good salad at the end. Um, uh, 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 one of our, your readers writes, uh, you have inspired me to want to eat in bed, but I am a neat freak. Any tips? <laughs> <laughs> I feel, well, yes, we, uh, my sister has something that she calls the food towel. So she puts a towel down when she eats in bed. It's like a very large bib. Yes, so it doesn't really matter. Yes. A, a large absorbent yes, bib. Yes, you just get a huge, you know, a bath towel on the bed and it's completely covered. <laughs> um, have tacos arrived in England? N yes, but, n n yes, but, um, and there are two uh, taquerias that are meant to be very good. I haven't been to them. I don't know. I, I would like to think they were very good. I mean, I love, you know, I love being on the West Coast and eating tacos, but it's, the thing is, it's really about, uh, you know, making the tortillas, isn't it? I feel rather bad that I have, when I have recipes for tacos, they're not really, you know, authentic. And I don't actually, you know, I, I let people buy them, which is, buy the taco, the, buy the tortillas, which is probably, you shouldn't let people do. <laughs> I shouldn't do. I let myself do, I should say. Yeah. When I was in Ireland, there were there were a couple of burrito places. Yeah, but but boy, no. I've, I've eaten, I've eaten <laughs> Irish burritos. A, I've eaten a burrito in Ireland, and I have to say, I really it, it nearly finished me off. But it, geez, I mean, I shouldn't have finished it, but it now is. you know why they drink so much. <laughs> um, I am traveling to Scotland next month. Should I try the haggis? Definitely. That's easy. Easy. Um, this may be a more extended answer for you. What is the one thing we want? We should all add to our diet besides kale, unhappy face, or oh, delete? Kale's <laughs> wonderful. Do you know what's so interesting? In my first book, so it shows how time changes, I chided everyone for not eating kale anymore. I said it was so wonderful, but just because it's not fashionable, you don't see it. We, it was called curly kale when I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what, I don't understand the should. Uh, about eating. I mean, you eat things that are good, and I don't, so I don't know what sort of is it is. This, I, d I don't know what sort of answer that someone is is asking in terms of should. Right, it's kind of the question of of uh, orthorexia almost. I mean, I always feel that you know, reading and eating are such pleasures. You, the, the one thing you don't need to say to people is, you know, you should read the, you know, read this. It's good for you. Eat this. It's good for you. It's like it's a funny way of going about it. Right. right. But anyway, kale's divine, and a very good, and also all those little you know creases that catch, uh, you know, either the olive oil or melted butter. Uh -huh. um, my biggest joy of watching you on TV is your love of food. My favorite part of your shows is seeing your late night snacking in front of the fridge. What is your favorite late night snack? Well, it really depends, you know, really it's about seeing what you have left over. I mean, it's a bit like cooking, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's mm -hmm. about seeing what you have left over. Um, look, I, I, I think there are a few things that are better than really good bread and butter. Really and good butter. Really oh. good butter. And I don't know whether you can get it, but we have a really, I, you know, I get really good, um, you know, raw butter. Mm -hmm. My God, it's so delicious. And, you, and I feel it's doing me good then. But, uh, and really good bread, you know, and I think those are, it's such a, there's such simple pleasure, mm -hmm. but it's, 
it's a very, it's very profound pleasure. And people have been eating bread, and they've been eating butter, and they've been making cheese, and for, for eons. I don't know what technically an eon is, so I'm <laughs> So we're safe. Yeah. Uh, what are some basic items you think makes any pantry and refrigerator great? Well, I, for me, good salt. Um, I like Malden salt, mm -hmm. and I use that a lot, and I think that it's, you know, it's, people are frightened of salt, and I'm not. Um, and I think lemons are essential. Uh, and I also, as you know, I like preserved lemons, but I couldn't exist without lemons. Good olive oil, very important. We've mm -hmm. touched on butter. Um, I, I think good, good sardines mm. in cans. You know, I sometimes, you know, sometimes if I'm get in and I haven't had time to, you know, to cook something much, I know I can make, um, you know, it's something I do quite a bit when I, I might cook a cauliflower um, and then toss it in a pan with uh, some sardines, lemon zest, and chopped parsley, dill, and toasted pine nuts. And th that's a really fantastic supper. So it's kind of like that anchovy, time. Italian anchovy thing. Well, it has, although it hasn't got that intense saltiness, and then I would much more draw on the lemon, but it's just a question of, oh, now I've got something to eat, and it's great. And funny enough, when I do it with broccoli, I use walnuts. I don't know why I do, but I think it works better that way. And so I suppose it's those things that you've got something to play with, and that makes a difference. Um, I, so I always have harissa as well, because I like heat, and that's very quick, and mm -hmm. I always, and oranges, I think oranges are great in cooking. Uh, have you ever featured a recipe on one of your shows, and or published it in one of your books, and then later decided you had a better version of it? Oh, I have, and I have it actually. It happens, doesn't it? I mean, I think it, it, it obviously happens, unless, you, and I think that every time you cook something, it's not that you think you have a better version, but you change it. It's very hard not to do that. I mean, I have actually, change something, so every now and then I've changed, added notes in, in subsequent editions of my book. Oh, really? I mean, it's sort of thing that publishers don't want to hear. <laughs> you know, but I, have, I have done that. I have done that sometimes as well. Um, what is an American food item that you wish more English people knew about or used, and vice versa? It could be a seasoning, condiment, yeah. or a particular dish. Well, I love Maya lemons. Am I pronouncing it right? Is it Maya? Mm -hmm. It is, isn't it? Um, I love Maya lemons, and we don't have those. And that, 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 I, that I think, are wonderful. Um, and as, a, as a someone who uh, loves citrus, I feel, I feel very envious. And... Um, well, in terms of what I would like to, what we have, I'm, I'm a great, I adore golden syrup. You could, Lyle's, is it? Because I think that corn syrup is fine, but I mean, to me, it's either, you know, you have maple syrup or you have golden syrup. And I think that corn syrup doesn't really taste of anything much. <laughs> and uh, I love golden syrup. And I, but also, I'm a great English mustard fan, as people know, and I feel that, um, I, the mustard with fire. I mean, English mustard is kind of like um, it's English wasabi, and, <laughs> it's, it, and, it, and it's wonderful. Um, who, yeah, Coleman's. Who were your early uh, inspirations? People who inspired you, uh, specifically in uh, cooking. Well, my mother did, and um, terrorized me in equal measure. <laughs> um, and. Otherwise, there's a writer called Anna Del Conte who is oh, now 92. Oh, I love her. You like Anna, she's great. She's Armand Chella Hazan. And in fact, she uh, did uh, edit Marcella Hazan for an English oh. public. I made a film with her um, oh, a, a year ago. I've never so met ago. her. She is absolutely wonderful. She does, she, um, She's still going, you know, 92, yeah. still going in recipes. And I had, you know, we, there was a documentary which I was very honored to take part in about her. And uh, her books are wonderful. As if, I don't know if you look her up, any, I don't know which ones are for sale in America, but she wrote the gastronomy of Italy. The and dictionary also, is, still, it, is available. Yes, and her book about the classic cuisine of Northern Italy is wonderful. And she's on, um, there was a wonderful book that's out of print that was called A Tavola in, in America, Entertaining Alitaliana, which I love, it's a rather old-fashioned title in England. And I think it's, um, 
a lot of the recipes are in a book that's called something like artichokes, am artichokes, um, amaretti, and apple cake or something, which is her, kind of her, <laughs> her greatest hits. It hasn't got pictures, so that's often you know, hard, but she's, she's a wonderful writer. She did a wonderful book on um, the, the history of pasta. Yes. And she went back and did a lot of research on, on kind of commercial pasta making and how, uh, how it developed. And yes. There was a great anecdote in it that, that when, um, in, in Naples, when they started making uh, uh, dried pasta in factories, but they would put the dough in these troughs and then the workmen would walk on it with their bare feet to knead it. <laughs> and so when they, when they finally uh, accepted some level of mechanization in, you know, in a very Italian fashion, what they did was they made these workers statues out of cast iron that looked like real people yeah. and then they would push them across, <laughs> oh, back and so forth across <laughs> the truck. That's so and, uh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, how would you define yourself as a cook, a baker, a food writer, a TV presenter? A food writer and an eater. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good, great place to end it. Oh, well, the, my pleasure. Thank you all so much.